Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Christ Community Chapel. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for being a part. If you're worshiping at the Aurora campus, uh, welcome, or at the Highland Square campus, or at Restoration Chapel, or just tuning in. Uh, glad you've joined us. Uh, let me begin like this. This last week, I was at a leadership conference, and there was a, a speaker there named Simon Simek, who wrote a book called Start With Why. And the idea was that every organization should always be asking the question, why do we exist? And he said every person, every one of us, should be asking the same question, why do I exist? Why do I do what I do? And here at Christ Community Chapel, uh, we answer the why question uh, from Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We feel like there is nothing better in the whole world than to connect somebody, to reconcile someone to the true and living God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus. Because we feel like that not only changes their now, we feel like that changes them forever. And every time someone does that, it changes the world just a little bit. So whenever someone comes and be, is reconciled to God through their faith in Jesus, through somebody in our church, we ask you guys to to call the church or to email the church and let us know and give us the name because then we, take, uh, we make a leaf, a little ceramic leaf to put on this mosaic uh, of a, like the tree of life, which is a stained glass window out there in the atrium. And we etch their initials in it. And uh, at, at the end of every month, we collect all the names and we make all the leaves and we put them all on at one time to just symbolize all these people who have come to Christ this last month. And so uh, this weekend, we add 68 leaves to that tree, uh, which is an amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, we absolutely love that. We also hosted the Remind Conference last weekend, which we told you was uh, coming for a while, where we had almost 1,000 young adults here to listen to some of the greatest uh, Christian thinkers in the world and then to have their questions answered. It was an amazing time. One of the many reasons we love uh, Robbie Zacharias Ministries is their commitment to the next generation. Because our faith is like a chain and each generation is a link in the chain. And if, if we lose one link to that chain, that means faith dies in a family or faith can die in a whole community or in a whole country. And our hope and our prayer here at Christ Community Chapel is that the next generation that is being raised up in this church will have a more robust faith than we have, that will do more with Jesus and for Jesus than we have ever dreamed of doing. That's our hope and our prayer. So that's why we were glad to host the Remind Conference, and it was a wonderful time. All right. We have a, a theme for this year, and it's transformed in 2018. And the promise from God is that you don't have to be the same. You don't have to be the same person that you are right now by the end of this year because God can change you. Every year we have a theme, but every year the theme fits into our purpose statement as a church, our answer to the why question, why we exist. We believe we exist to make disciples, and those disciples are made in three different kind of phases. We want people to help people come to know Jesus. That's the first stage. That's why we have those leaves. That's why we celebrate any time someone comes to faith in Jesus. And we exist to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus and then learn to serve Him daily. That's why we exist. You know, Vince Lombardi was that great football coach. In fact, he was so great that uh, if you win the Super Bowl, you get the Vince Lombardi trophy. 
And he was famous for starting the first day of practice with the Green Bay Packers the same way every year. He would hold up a football and say, this gentleman is a football. And he would do it because he felt like uh, to fulfill their potential as football players, they always need to have just a relentless commitment to the fundamentals. And we feel like it's the same with us. So way back in February, we had a three-week series on the first phase of being a disciple. We called it, it No 101. And we, uh, we looked at what it means to really believe in Jesus the first week. The second week, we talked about what it really means to belong to Jesus and his family, the church. And then finally, the last week, we talked about what it means to be baptized, to go public with that commitment to Jesus. And that week, if you remember, I gave this short little kind of blurb about what it means to be baptized. And then I said to everyone, listen, if this is you and you want to go public and saying, I follow Jesus, I want everybody to know, then we have made everything ready for, for you. If you're ready, we're ready. And we did our first ever, what we called spontaneous baptism. And that weekend at the Hudson campus, 451 of you were baptized. One of the most amazing things I have ever been a part of. Later on at the Aurora campus, another 68 people were baptized. Later on at the, at the Highland Square campus, another 25 people were baptized. Then back to this campus and 112 people were baptized. It's been a great, great year for people to return to the basics and know and remember what it means to know Jesus. Uh, this week, you know, we start our next three-week series for the fundamentals with what we call Grow 101, where we look at that second phase of being a disciple, and we're calling this message a different way to live, a different way to live. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 42 through 47. Uh, Peter has just finished preaching the very first Christian sermon. And right after his sermon, 3,000 people come to know Jesus for the first time. And right after they come to know Jesus, this is what happens next. This is verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is God's word. All right, so, so Jesus uh, gives birth to this group of people who become his followers, and immediately they begin to gather together. And not only get gathered together, they actually begin to do life together. And let me stop right there and ask the obvious question. Why? Why would they gather together? Why did they feel like that's what it meant to follow Jesus? I asked that question because I, uh, I just ordered this book and I read it uh, a couple weeks ago. It, I got it for the title. It's, it's actually an academic paper that somebody made into this little book. And the title is, Why on Earth Did Anyone Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? By Larry Hurtado. Why on earth did anyone become a Christian in the first three centuries? And it's a fascinating book because he says there was no advantage in fact, there's tremendous disadvantages personally. There, you, you did so at great personal loss, at great social loss. You lost all your friends, all your connections. Many times you lost your job. At times you could lose your life. It was a terrible time to become a Christian. It's almost like if you imagine becoming a Christian in a country like Iraq or Afghanistan and the price you would pay. Of course, the question is, why take the risk of gathering publicly if that was true? Why not just live your faith out privately like so many Americans do today? Why gather together like the first century did? There are three points that I want to pull out of this passage. I want to talk about why worship together, why love together, why serve together. Why worship together? 
Why love together? Why serve together? First, why worship together? Uh, Verse 42 and 43. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. That word awe is a great word for worship, which is one of the reasons why uh, Jim College, our founding pastor, uh, hates it, bristles, when anyone uses the word awesome to describe anything other than God. But people use that word awesome because there's so many little words that are packed into that word awe. There's a sense of fear. There's a sense of wonder. There's a sense of amazement. There's even affection and love all packed in that word. That's why people like to use that word. Worship, though, is one of the only things that can recalibrate the human soul. Let me say that again. Worship is one of the only things that can recalibrate your soul. And your soul is very unstable, and so is mine. And when I say unstable, what I mean is that uh, it can flip, I mean, radically, completely. I I wanted to get one of those mechanisms that would be like this, and at the slightest provocation would just like flip like that, because that's what happens. I change positions with God, which seems crazy to even say. But there are times when, if, when I, I need to recalibrate my soul because my go-to kind of reaction is to become the center of the universe and have God kind of orbit me instead of me orbiting God. I become the boss and God becomes my assistant. Right? It probably happens to you. I think it does happen to you. Like I, I'll ask God to do things for me from big things like heal me or heal somebody that I love to small things like give me wisdom for a decision I'm going to make. But if he asks you to do something, sometimes you say, oh, listen, I'm really busy. I'm traveling a lot. My job, or I got to take the kids to soccer practice. I really can't do what you ask me to do. <laughs> Imagine if you struggle with keeping your, the relationship you have with your boss at work straight. Right? Imagine if If sometimes your boss would come in and you'd be sitting in your boss's chair in their office and they would go, what are you doing? And you go, oh, I forgot again. I forgot that this is your office and not my office. All right, I'll go, right? If you're the boss, imagine what it'd be like to have a subordinate come to you and say, listen, I'm having a really hectic day. Here, here's a list of stuff that I'd love for you to do for me. Could you get this done? You'd be going, what are you thinking? Worship does something to recalibrate your soul. Worship reminds you of two truths that could not be more important. You mess up these two truths, your soul is messed up whether you realize it or not. Worship reminds you of who God is, and worship reminds you of what you are. Worship reminds you of who God is, and worship reminds you of what you are. And it does it almost simultaneously. It happens like right back to back. Let me, uh, I'll show you uh, three different passages. One, the first one is Isaiah. One of my all-time favorite passages. And if you know this passage, it's probably one of yours too. It starts like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In the book of Job, when uh, Job for 38 chapters has been demanding an audience with God to ask him why, demand from him, why has this happened to me? God shows up, and this is the way Job responds in chapter 42. It says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Finally, uh, in Luke, Peter is a professional fisherman. And he has fished all night, caught nothing. This is the first time he meets Jesus. He comes in. Jesus borrows his boat to use it to preach. Afterwards, he says to Peter, Peter, why don't you go ahead and go out and throw your nets and fish? And Peter says, to, he kind of goes, oh, Jesus, uh, you probably don't know this because you're not a professional, but it's not the right time to fish. Nighttime is the best time to fish, and I fished all night. Caught nothing. There's no use to go out now. Jesus kind of says, humor me. Right? So Peter goes out. This is what happens. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, so large that their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man Oh, Lord. Okay, here's my question. Why those responses? Why, why didn't Isaiah, after seeing him, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seraphim flying around him. Why didn't Isaiah say, that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Those seraphim are huge. Why did they have six wings? This is great. Right, why didn't he do that? Why did he say, woe is me. I'm undone. What can I do? He falls on his face. Why doesn't Job say, finally, you showed up. Why did all this happen to me? Why did he fall on his face and say, I repent in dust and ashes. I have, I have said things that are, that, that are, it's too wonderful for me to even comprehend. Why did you do that? Why did Peter do what he, why didn't Peter look at Jesus and go, not bad, Rabbi. You and I, could go into business together, we would, we would corner the market on fish. Why does Peter say, you got to get away from me? Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Because when you worship, there are two things that will happen, and it'll happen right back to back. If you get a glimpse of God, you will get a whiff of yourself. You catch a glimpse of God, you get a whiff of who you are. And so you will begin to repent. That's why worship. But the question is, why worship together? Why we gather together to worship? Why not just do it at home? Why not just keep watching on the internet? Why not come in? All right. Why? You know why? Why do people go to concerts instead of staying at home and just listening to a CD? Why do people go to games instead of just watching TV in their homes? And the answer is something different happens. Both are important, by the way. One time of worship a week is not enough to recalibrate your soul, which is why every single day I sit in the same chair in my house in the morning and I try to recalibrate my soul before I start my day. And then once a week I come in and I do it with you. Because there's something else that happens when we worship together. It's like jumping into a stream and having it carry you along. It's like flowing over a waterfall because there's something about worshiping together where your worship pulls me and my worship can pull you closer to God. One of the things the early church did at great risk was they decided we have to worship together. Because there's something that happens there that can't happen any other way. So that was one of the ways that they began to do life together. They worship together. Second thing is why love together. Look at verse 45. It says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Um, here's a question. How do you know you love somebody? Well, one of the ways that you know you love somebody is if you begin to love who they love. That's true. 
When you start to love somebody that the person you love loves, you know you really love them. Let me give you an example. Uh, my daughter, Becca, came in for the Remind Conference last weekend, and she uh, lives in Houston. She arrived in Cleveland uh, at like 11.30 uh, in the evening on Thursday night. So I had to drive up to Cleveland at 11.30 and pick her up and drive home, so it made it for a late night. Um, let's say I couldn't go. Um, and this is going to be a little risky. Is there anybody here, and, and I, I would like you to, to raise your hand if you would, is there anybody here that I could have asked and said, would you go pick up my daughter for me? And you'd go. Would you raise your hand? <laughs> Thanks. I was afraid nobody would go. I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> Let me ask you this, though. Is there anybody here, and you can raise your hand again, that was thinking, I would love for you to ask me. I wish you would ask me. Would you raise your hand? Cool. That's good. You know why you do that, I think? It's because you feel like I've done something for you. You feel like because of I'm your pastor or because I, I preach or whatever, there's something inside of you that goes, you know what? It would be my privilege. I would love to do that for you. You may not even know my daughter, but you'll say, I will love who you love because I love you. Right? Back to this book. All right, so... The question is, why on earth did anyone become a Christian in the first three centuries? One of the interesting things about the early church is how diverse it was. It was the most diverse religion the world has ever known. still is, by the way. Christianity is still the most diverse religion ever. This is, I mean, I'll read you just a couple of verses. This is from Galatians chapter 3. Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 11. It says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. What happened from the very beginning with the Christian church is that people gathered together. that had, They would never have rubbed shoulders other than coming to church, other than being a part of this. That you'd be, you'd be in a a group like this, and there would be people who are educated and uneducated, rich and poor, black and white, Scythian and barbarian, whatever that is, right? And you'd be everything, and you know why you're here? Everybody would be here for the same reason, because you heard God say to you, I love you, and I gave my son for you, and that makes you my son, and that makes you my daughter. And so this group of people who had all heard the same thing, God say to them, I love you. I make you my son. I make you my daughter. And then they gather together and God says, now love each other. Love the person in front of you. Love the person behind you. Love the person next to you. Because I love them. So the reason that they would sell their possessions, that they would meet the needs of everybody around them, is because they heard Jesus say, hey, would you do this for this person? Would you do this for this person that I love? And hands shot up and said, I would love to do that for you. I will do that for them because I love you, because of what you've done for me. They loved each other. Something that makes the church just an amazing thing. It should make us an amazing place to be a part of. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, you know what, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. And I always think, I don't know. You may have a bigger problem than you think you do. Because it's really hard to love somebody and then hate what they love, who they love. Like, if you go to my wife, or if you go, come to me and you say, Pastor Joe, I love you, but I hate your wife. That's, all right, let me, I, let me switch that around because everybody loves my wife. But <laughs> let's say you go to my wife. You want to see a different side of her? You go to my wife and say, I love you, but I hate your husband and I hate your kids. You think Mrs. Potato Head has angry eyes. You see my wife's eyes after that statement. 
Jesus says, I love my church. You love me. You love the people around you. Right? Because I love them. Because I love them. Right? So the, the people that are sitting around you right now, the people that Jesus says, listen, if they have a need, will you meet it for me? And he wants us to say, absolutely. I would do anything for you. One of the reasons that we want people in community groups is that it's easier to do in community groups because then you're, you're just with like 10 or 15 people and you can say, oh, there's a need. There's somebody that Jesus loves. And, and now I am, I am learning to love who Jesus loves. Right? So we, we in three weeks, we're going to start a series on Ephesians. It's going to last 10 weeks. We're going to call it Ephesians together. We're asking every community group to do this study. What we're going to do is, uh, as I prepare a message on Ephesians, uh, on Thursday, I'm going to give it to a couple of guys, and they're going to make a community group study out of the message so that you'll hear it on the weekend, and then you will study it in a group, and you'll dig deeper in that, and we'll do Ephesians together. That's the thing. And if you're not a part of a community group right now, I would just ask you to become one for 10 weeks. Just see. But the early church, they didn't just gather together to worship together. The early church really loved each other. And the final thing is the early church served each other. This is the, they served together. This is what it says, verse 47. Praising God and finding favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Um, it says they found favor with all the people, not just the people that they were, you know, it's a huge crowd. 3,000 people came to Christ. God was adding to their number daily, so it becomes a huge crowd. Any huge crowd that you're not a part of is a hassle, right? Think of going down to Cleveland for a meeting or for dinner, and you forgot there's an Indians game. And all of a sudden, you're just going, oh, man, there's traffic. It's harder to park. Everything's a hassle if there's a big group that you're not a part of. How is it they found favor with all the people? Well, they were doing something. They were reaching out. They were serving. There's a great quote that's been preserved by a pagan, by the pagan emperor Julian. And Julian hated Christians. And this is his quote. He says, those cursed Galileans, that's what he called Christians, those cursed Galileans, they care for their, they not only care for their poor, but they care for ours as well. And he was going, he was like saying, they don't even play fair. No wonder so many people are becoming Christians because they are serving even the people that aren't a part of their group. And that's something that, that we do. I'm going to tell you two quick stories about serving, and then we'll be done. Now, we have a tradition here at Christ Community Chapel that starts in Thanksgiving and ends at Christmas. Uh, for years, we called it You've Been Gifted, and now we've changed it to Just Because. You can actually do either one. But the idea is to blanket this area of 10,000 acts of random kindness and generosity. We have a little card that says you've been gifted or just because, and you hand it to the person, and you say, we just want you to know that God loves you, and this is why we do this, right? So uh, this is one of my all-time favorite stories of You've Been Gifted. I got a call from a guy who doesn't even go here. His parents come here, uh, but he would come here sporadically. His name's Joe, but he called me. And he said, Pastor Joe, I got to tell you the story. I said, okay. He said, I was driving along at night. It was one of those freezing nights. It was like almost zero degrees. And I saw somebody walking on the side of the road, so I pulled over and I said, you want to ride? And this guy said, sure, and he jumped in. And I told him, I said, listen, I want, you to, tell you, I want, to, want to tell you why I gave you a ride. Uh, my parents go to a church, and they do this thing called You've Been Gifted, where you're supposed to do some random act of kindness or generosity. This is mine. You've been gifted. Right? <laughs> the guy who got in his car said, that's Christ Community Chapel, right? And Joe said, how'd you know? And he said, the other day I was at a store, and I was buying gloves. And a guy stepped in front of me, and he said, I want to buy your gloves. And I said, no, that's okay. And he said, no, I insist. You've been gifted. And he handed me this card that said, you've been gifted. It was from Christ Community Chapel. And Joe goes, no kidding. And then Joe said, i got to go by the pharmacy before I drop you off where I'm supposed to drop you off. So, I, so then Joe's telling me the story. He said, so I pulled up to the pharmacy, 
to the window to get the medicine. When they handed me the medicine, this guy whose name was Dale reached across me and said, I'll pay for that, gave them a $50 bill, turned to Joe and said, you've been gifted, right? <laughs> that was the greatest story. So I told it the next weekend to you guys. And I told it, and everybody responded the same way. After the service, guy walks up to me and he says, Pastor Joe, I'm Dale. This guy behind me, he's the one who bought my gloves. Dale ended up giving his life to Christ. Dale's wife gave his life to Christ. I did their daughter's wedding like two weeks ago, right? Dale, it wasn't one thing that made Dale come. It was like a one-two punch. And after the second time somebody said, you've been gifted, it was like he said, I gotta go find out. Why do people do that? And he came here and he was reconciled to the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. Second story. I used to take mission trips uh, with kids, with teenagers. And I took this one trip, this is like 25 years ago, and there were people here uh, and who are part of our church now that were a part of that trip when they were 17. Uh, I took 60 17-year-olds. They were in between their junior and senior year in high school down to the Dominican Republic to work on this orphanage. And we were uh, building, we were pouring the roof, and we had to do it in one kind of thing because we didn't have a, um, a cement mixer. We had to mix it all by hand. Then we had to shovel it, one shovel at a time, up three kind of platforms into a wheelbarrow and then had it go to the place in the roof. Um, we started at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in about 100-degree heat. We finished at midnight that night. Um, what's that, 11 hours later? We figured it up, we, we poured, we mixed by hand 90 tons of concrete. During that day, I watched 17 year olds mix concrete, stand there uh, while somebody fed them with a fork because they were covered with concrete. I watched guys grab other guys' shoulders and work the cramps out of their shoulders. Those kids worked nonstop for 11 hours. At the end of it, we all like celebrated by walking to the river to bathe. And when we were walking to the river, we were singing. And I want to tell you this, not, there isn't a 17-year-old in the world that could do what we did by himself or by themselves. They would never work that hard, but together, those kids did something that was unbelievable. That's why we serve together. We're the church. Vince Lombardi would hold up a trophy or hold up a, a football and say, this gentleman is a football. Jesus looks at you, at the people sitting around you, and says, this is my church. And he calls us to worship together. He says, will you love what I love? For me, we love together, and then we serve together. And Jesus says, if you do life together, let me live right in the middle of that. I will change you, I will change them, and together... I will change the world. It's the church. Transformed. 2018. Together. Together we grow. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we uh, come to you and thank you for being the one who, uh, who loves us with just a fierce and ferocious love. And we are here because you have loved us, called us your children, and then you placed us together in this group to be the church so we could love each other, so we could worship together, love together, serve together. I pray that we will do that, and as we do, I pray that you will change us and then use us to change this world. Thanks. We pray this in your Son's name and our Savior Jesus. Amen.